welcome to another MIGLABS lesson. Today's lesson is going to be on hyperthermia and heat-related illnesses. Hyperthermia and the heat-related illnesses that accompany hyperthermia. I figured this would be appropriate given the changing season, it's getting warmer, people are going out more, and as pre-hospital providers, we're more likely to see an increase in these sorts of cases. So the most serious of all the hyperthermia emergencies, of all the heat-related illnesses, is heat stroke. I'm sure you've all at least heard of heat stroke. And really, there's a whole spectrum of heat-related illnesses, but we're going to focus for this lesson on heat stroke. It has a mortality rate of up to 30%, meaning up to 30% of the patients who get this will die, um, depending on the study you look at. But either way, that's a pretty serious statistic. So we have to treat heat stroke like a very serious emergency. It is a serious emergency. So we can divide heat stroke. Let's make a new slide here. We can divide heat stroke into two categories. Two categories. And those categories are based on how the patient gets heat stroke. So category one is what we call exertional. Exertional heat stroke. And like the name implies, this is people who are exerting themselves or overexerting themselves. People who go out, they're working really strenuously, really hard in a hot environment and it leads to them getting heat stroke. The other type is what we call classic heat stroke, or it's also sometimes called non-exertional heat stroke. So this is people who are not necessarily exerting themselves, but they're just out exposed to the heat. An example that I like to use for classic heat stroke is think of a sporting event, and you've got a spectator who's sitting in the stands, they're sitting in direct sunlight, it's a long game, maybe three, four hours or more and they've just been sitting in the sun baking all day, getting hotter and hotter until finally the body can't compensate anymore. And that leads me to another point that I'd like to bring up, and that's that a lot of people describe heat-related illness as being when your body heat gain exceeds body heat loss. So your body can no longer get rid of the heat that it's gaining. It, it loses control. So how do we diagnose it? Well, the good thing is that exertional and classic heat stroke are treated very similarly. And diagnosing is more or less the same, too. Diagnosing heat stroke. Heat stroke. Sorry, I'm not a very fast writer. So there are a couple uh, key things we look for. The first one is going to be core temperature, body core temperature. And when I say core temperature, I mean we need to get a true core temperature. We need to get a rectal temperature. Uh, studies have shown that using other forms like an oral temperature or an axillary under the arm temperature, they just don't work reliably in heat stroke patients. They don't give us an accurate representation of what the true core temperature is. So you really need to take rectal temperatures on these patients. To diagnose this heat stroke, the core temperature has to be 40 degrees Celsius or above, and that's the same as 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's item number one. Item number two is some sort of central nervous system abnormality. Some sort of central nervous system abnormality. And this can be uh, as simple as just an altered level of consciousness. Maybe they forget where they are. Maybe they become confused. It can be much more serious like seizures or it can even be coma. So some sort of involvement of the central nervous system. Those are our two real hallmarks for diagnosing heat stroke. Now, I will take a pause here to say that just because a patient has, let's say, um, a core temperature that's high, but they don't have CNS abnormality yet, technically they don't have heat stroke per these standards, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be worried. Because if their core temperature is that high, then they are at a very serious risk for developing heat stroke. So don't look at a patient and say, well, yeah, they're hot but the CNS is normal, so I'm not worried about them. No, you should still be worried because it, it, it might only be a matter of minutes before they progress to full-blown heat stroke with some sort of altered mental state or seizures or coma. So don't get trapped into thinking that you shouldn't be worried just because they have one and not the other. There is a myth here. I'll put this down here as a myth. People say in heat stroke, the patient will stop sweating. Patient stops sweating. And this is a very common myth. I've heard this all over the place, and not even just EMS. I've heard it from lay people, too. It seems to be this, this very common, widespread misconception that heat stroke patients 
don't sweat anymore. I, I've heard it explained that they lose the ability to sweat or they sweated out all of their fluids. That's really, that's not true. Now, some heat stroke patients do stop sweating. That is true in some patients, but there have been plenty of documented cases of patients who are in full-blown heat stroke and they continue to sweat. And this is especially true in those exertional heat stroke patients. If they've been working out strenuously, if they've been exercising or doing some sort of manual labor and they've been really exerting themselves, they're going to be sweating. They're going to be diaphoretic. That's normal. So this is another trap you're going to be careful not to fall into. Don't think that just because your patient is sweating, they can't be in heat stroke. They can absolutely be in heat stroke and still sweat. All right, so that's it for diagnosis. It seems pretty simple. There's only those two points, but heat stroke goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed very frequently. It is a very commonly misdiagnosis, so be careful. And we're going to talk a little bit at the end about how to be careful what to watch out for. But now let's talk about management. So you have a patient and you've diagnosed them with heat stroke, or that's your field impression for those of you who are afraid of the word diagnose. Uh, our field impression is that this patient is in heat stroke. So let's talk about how to manage that heat stroke. The number one thing you want to do, and I'm going to put this in big letters because this is very important, remove the patient from the heat source. Remove the patient from whatever that heat source is. So to go back to that early example where uh, you've had a spectator at some sort of sporting event and they're sitting in the stands, get them out of the stands. Get them out of direct sunlight. Take them to a first aid room or to some shaded area or just some place that's not in the direct heat environment that they came from that caused the illness. If you don't take your patient out of the heat source, there's no way you can treat them. The second thing you want to do, and this is also pretty important, is you want to cool the patient. You need to get that temperature back down. Your body thermoregulates. It controls its own temperature, but the problem, once you get that hot, the body really loses its ability to thermoregulate. It cannot control its own temperature the way that it's supposed to be able to, and it gets really bad at cooling itself. So once they become victims of heat stroke, you as a pre-hospital provider need to help their bodies cool off. And there are a lot of ways to do this. So I'm going to make a whole new slide here, and we're going to start talking about all the different ways to cool patients. Let's put this in blue since we're cooling them. Cooling patients. So no matter what you do, no matter how you choose to cool the patient, you want to shoot for an end goal of about 38 degrees Celsius. 38 degrees Celsius or... 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll just call it 100 degrees Fahrenheit so we can leave the decimals out of this. This is your end point. You don't want to cool the patients down any further below that 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And while that is still a little warmer than we normally are, it's a little bit above our, our normal homeostatic temperature, we don't want to go below that because then we risk overshooting. Uh, then we risk cooling them off too far and actually making them hypothermic. Now, this is a little controversial, this endpoint. A lot of different doctors, a lot of different scientists, a lot of different researchers will tell you a different endpoint. I've heard 38, I've heard 39, I've heard 38.5 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, degrees Celsius. So it's a little controversial, but this 38 seems to be a generally agreed upon point. Most people say that 38 is, is okay. So how do we get the patient there? How do we cool them? One option is with warm water mist warm water mist and some sort of airflow, a fan or you can actually manually fan the patient like with some paper or something but some sort of airflow over their skin. Now you might say, hold on, warm water, if our patient is hyperthermic, why are we going to give them warm water? Shouldn't we give them cold water? And the problem is that when you put cold water on the body, two things happen. The one thing is that the extremities will vasoconstrict, so the vessels in your arms and legs will get smaller to prevent heat loss. It's a normal reaction from the body. But in this case, we want heat loss. So by vasoconstricting, we're not getting that heat loss that we want. So you're kind of counteracting what you're trying to do. The second thing is that when the skin gets cold, it triggers shivering. And again, shivering is a normal compensatory mechanism the body has to try and increase its body temperature. The skin is cold, so the body thinks it needs to warm up and it starts shivering, and now that core temperature either stays where it was or gets even higher. And so, again, you're kind of counteracting what you're trying to do. By using some warm water mist, you don't get that, and then the airflow causes evaporation. Evaporation is your body's primary way of cooling itself. Evaporation is good in patients. And it's also one of the most effective ways to cool off. 
So you put some warm water mist on the patient, and then you use some airflow to evaporate it, and that'll cool them off very effectively. This is one of the most preferred methods if you have the resources to do this. Another method is you can use ice packs or even just ice. But like we said, you can cause some vasoconstriction in the extremities and you can cause shivering. So you only want to put these um, against the core, to the core of the patient's body. And when we say core, we're talking about the armpits, the axilla, the neck, and the groin. That's where you get some very large vessels, a lot of blood flow, and so you can have the most benefit. It's generally recommended that you do not cover the patient with ice sheets or cold, wet blankets. Um, cover the patient with ice sheets. And the reason for that is, like we talked about, when you cool off the extremities, you cause a vasoconstriction, so you stop the heat transfer, and you can trigger the body to start shivering, which is going to increase the heat production. So generally speaking, most people recommend you do not cover the patient with ice sheets. Continuing with our methods for cooling the patient. Cooling the patient. There are a couple more options here that we can use. One of these is cool water immersion. Cool water immersion. Like the name suggests, this is where you're oops, immersing the patient in cool water. And this is kind of considered the golden standard for exertional heat stroke, uh, not for classic heat stroke. You do not want to do this for classic heat stroke. So let me put green exertional, but not for classic. That's why it's in red here, classic, and I'm going to cross it out. Now you may say, hold on, just a minute ago we were talking about how if you get the patient too cold, they can start shivering, they can start vasoconstricting. So how would immersing them in a cool water bath, how would that help? Well, and the reason is because the torso is actually exposed to the cool water here. It's not like the ice sheets where you're mostly getting on the extremities. You're actually getting the patient's whole body into the cool water. So their torso is being exposed and you have direct heat transfer between their core and the water outside. However, you can still have vasoconstriction in the extremities, and you can also still trigger shivering. If your patient is shivering, they are not cooling effectively. If your patient starts shivering, you need to stop whatever you are doing and reevaluate and come up with some sort of new management plan because shivering means they are not cooling off. Another problem with a cool water immersion is that access to the patient can be very difficult. You know, they're in water, so it's going to be difficult if you want to try and start an IV or put a pulse ox on or do anything like that. And speaking of monitoring, most of our monitors are not waterproof, so you can't really get any good cardiac monitoring on a patient who's underwater. So if they have some sort of cardiac dysrhythmia or something develop, it's going to take you a while to catch that. You're not going to see it on the monitor as it happens. It's not going to be until after you take them out of the cool water bath and put them on the monitor that you notice, oh, they have a cardiac dysrhythmia. So these are some of the drawbacks of the cool water immersion. But one of the big advantages is that it's very rapid. It's very quick. Generally, the patient will cool off one degree Celsius every five minutes or about one degree Fahrenheit every three minutes. So that's pretty quick. That's one of the most rapid methods we have for cooling our patients. So if you have an exertional heat stroke patient, not a classic, but an exertional heat stroke patient, and you have the resources, you have a cool water bath, you can consider using this method, just watching out for those drawbacks that we just talked about. There have been some reports of successfully using cooled IV fluid or chilled IV fluid. And this is an option, but it hasn't been studied very thoroughly yet. It's mostly case studies. There hasn't been a full-blown study to look at the effects of this. And you have a, a pretty big risk of overshooting and, like we talked about before, bringing the temperature down too far when you use cooled IV fluid. And finally, the few studies that have been done have shown that patients who get cooled IV fluids and patients who just have ice to the groin, axilla, and the neck, like we talked about on the last slide, both populations have the same rate of cooling off. They cool off just as quickly either way. So... For me personally, I think that putting the ice in the axilla, the neck, and the groin has much lower risks, but you're getting the same benefits. So I, I would rather do that. But this is something you can consider, the cooled IV fluids. Just work with your medical director on a protocol. So these are all of the methods that I want to talk about for cooling the patient. Of course, there are other methods, but I think these are the ones that are most feasible 
for the pre-hospital setting. These are the ones that we're going to be able to do. I want to talk a little bit about timing. How quickly do we cool them off? So obviously, the quicker we can cool them, the better. As soon as you notice you want it, that the patient is hyperthermic, you want to cool them off. Quick equals good. Now, there have been studies where they showed that up to 40 minutes later, they were able to cool patients down just as quickly as they were initially. So whenever you catch it, you want to treat it, even if it may have maybe happened 40 minutes ago and it took them 40 minutes to seek EMS care for some reason. You can still cool them off, but morbidity and mortality, so this is patients having complications and patients dying, is directly correlated, directly related to the length of time that they were hypothermic related to, we'll say, the duration of hypothermia, hyperthermia, excuse me. So the longer that the patient is hyperthermic, the higher their risk of having organ damage and other long-term irreversible damage. So you want to cool them off as quickly as you can. Let's get back to our management options. Management. So we talked about, so far in management, removing them from the heat, getting the patient out of whatever that heat source is. We've talked about cooling them off. We need to cool them. What are some other things we need to do? So we're going to need to manage dehydration. There's a good chance that your patients will become dehydrated, especially the exertional heat stroke patients, but even the classic heat stroke patients. So you want to assess them for dehydration and treat as necessary. But be very careful here. There's a big warning here, and that's that not all hyperthermic patients, not all patients with heat-related illness, are dehydrated. They often are. It's, it's common for the two to go hand in hand, but they don't by definition go together. And we see patients who are hypothermic are at an increased risk for pulmonary edema and for fluid overload. The problem is we get these hyperthermic patients, we get these heat stroke patients, and we think, oh, they're dehydrated, and we load them full of fluids, lots and lots and lots of IV fluids, more than they need. And so where does that fluid back up once you've overloaded the body? It backs up into the lungs. So be very careful. Treat dehydration and hyperthermia separately. They're not the same thing. And keep in mind that the proper treatment for heat stroke for hyperthermia is not fluid replacement. It's cooling. Cooling the patient off. If they're hyperthermic, you need to get rid of that excess heat. So the proper treatment is to cool the patient off, not fluid therapy, not fluid replacement. You may have heard of people using medications to manage hyperthermic patients, and there's really no evidence to support that. Medication management. So I'm just going to write here, don't do it. There are no medications that have been proven to effectively treat heat stroke. There are a couple trials going on. There are a couple experiments. Maybe something will work. But as of right now, there are no proven medications that help treat heat stroke. One misconception that some people have is that they can give an antipyretic drug, an anti-fever drug like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, paracetamol, Tylenol, aspirin, something like that. One of these drugs we normally give to reduce fevers. The problem is that those drugs treat internal causes for fever, something inside your body, but hyperthermia is an external cause. Your body is being heated up by the environment. So giving those drugs is not going to help the patient. And you also may aggravate coagulopathy and heat-related organ damage by giving those, those drugs. So I'm just going to reiterate here, don't do it. Don't give your patients medication to try and treat hyperthermia. It's not going to work. Best case, nothing's going to happen. Worst case, you might actually injure your patient worse. Don't do it. Earlier in this presentation, earlier in the lesson, we talked about as a pre-hospital provider, being prepared for these sorts of emergencies. How can we prepare ourselves for these sorts of emergencies? Well, we also talked about how this is one of the most commonly missed or incorrectly diagnosed conditions, hyperthermia. People often confuse it with other things. So just keep a very high index of suspicion. Maintain index of suspicion. I'm just going to make up an acronym here and call it index of suspicion because I can't write very quick. Maintain an index of suspicion, especially if you're working in climates that are at higher risk for causing hyperthermia. 
high humidity has been linked to a much higher risk. So if you're in a very humid environment, you want to be careful. You also want to be uh, alert and have a high index of suspicion if you're working with non-acclimatized populations. Non-acclimatized populations. So what sort of populations are not acclimatized? A big one is college campuses. You get these students who are arriving from all over the country and maybe they they grew up in the Midwest or they grew up on the East Coast and now they've decided to come out to school in the Southwest or California, or Texas or somewhere, or my favorite, Arizona. And they're just not used to the heat. They're not familiar with how to manage themselves and how to drink water and how to stay in the shade. So they're not acclimatized. They're at a much higher risk. Uh, we also talked about high humidity. So be careful if you're working in a high humidity environment. And there are some certain exogenous factors. So things that uh, are brought into the body from the outside, mostly medications, exogenous factors, that can increase your risk. There are several. I'm only going to go over a couple, but a big one is alcohol. Patients who've been drinking alcohol are, are at an increased risk. Antihistamines like diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Uh, antipsychotic medication. Antiplatelet drugs, even something like aspirin. Beta blockers beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diuretic stimulants. There are a number of them, and you can look at the MIGLABS lesson page, the PDF we have on our website, and that lists a few more. So that sums up our lesson on hyperthermia, our lesson on heat stroke. We talked about diagnosing it. We talked about managing it. We talked about some pitfalls to avoid, and hopefully you've learned something. If you think I missed anything or if you want to contribute or add, I highly encourage you to do that. MIG Labs is collaborative, so you can leave a comment on the YouTube section. You can go to our website and leave a comment on the lesson page. And like I just mentioned, I highly encourage you to go to our lesson page and download the lesson PDF outline. It has a little bit more detail than what I'm able to go into in the videos. It follows along sort of a logical progression, so you can see where I'm going if my train of thoughts kind of go off on a tangent. And it has all of our references, so if you want to read more and learn more and kind of dig deeper into this, you can look up some of those references and find out more. Thanks for coming, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.